Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and welcome to Master Leadership. Great leaders ask great questions, and this podcast takes you on a journey to master leadership with questions that matter to leaders who matter with your host, Lily Sinabria. Hi, this is Lily, and welcome to Master Leadership, where we connect with leaders worldwide to gain insights on important topics to help us on our journey towards greater significance. If you would like to participate as a guest, or if you have a question that you would like to ask a guest, go to masterleadership.org for more information. Brian Van Corn is the author of Health Carelessness. This is the true story of a very special man whose life was suddenly and forever changed by a rare disease. Dealing with a severe backache for three days, he was taken to an emergency room. And for five grueling months, his world, his dignity, his very self was stripped away. Trapped in a system that all too often is not health care, but health careless. Brian is a rare storyteller with a powerful ability to recall fine details. From the first word to the last, he will take you on an emotional roller coaster ride. His path began in a hell none of us would hope to experience. In the end, it ascends into a tale of triumph and inspiration. This is One Man's Journey to and from Paralysis. Welcome, Brian Van Corn. How are you? I'm doing fine. You're brilliant. Look at you. <laughs> You're shining. I am. That's actually the bridge in Utah. Fantastic. All right. So we are excited. We're happy to have you on our podcast. Are you ready to pour into our listeners? I am. Awesome. Brian, I feel like this has been a long time coming um, and we're finally here. So I'm super excited. So tell us a bit about your path to leadership and what you're doing now. I've owned my own recording studio in the past and I've worked with some very interesting people, specifically some people who have actually uh, won some pretty high awards in the industry, Oscar winners, Emmy Award winners, people of this nature. And um, I got a lot of mentoring from working with these fellows. Mm -hmm. uh, in particular, uh, do you remember a movie called Dirty Dancing? Do I remember? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I worked with the gentleman who won the Oscar on that. So. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. The powerful leader and what he was looking to do to help a lot of communities, especially with the monies that he parlayed from getting that Oscar. He was able to help a lot of uh, children and so I was working with him on various and different projects. So other things for leadership that I've done in the past, I worked on a project that was called uh, Paranormal Performances. It was an interesting experiment. And what we were looking to do here was to help people to elicit different emotional responses through using, using auditory triggering, things of this nature. And we were definitely right out there uh, on the cutting edge of doing this. Mm -hmm. Actually, we did, Liliana, we actually went to a place uh, where there had been angelic sightings had mm -hmm. taken place. And what we did was we took a special recorder that was able to pick up the three-dimensional sound of the space. And we embedded that into our recordings. And so from working in the industry, many, many years later, I started to put together reality shows for Comcast. And consequently... We were green lighted to do three reality shows. So, specifically, had to do with programs on demand. We're just starting this out. Mm -hmm. So, I was in Philadelphia at the time, and we were taking uh, great shots of this particular uh, ensemble I was with at the time. And uh, while I was in Philadelphia, uh, I slipped and I fell into some muddy water. Mm -hmm. and what actually happened was I got home and I noticed there seemed to be something crawling on my leg. And uh, what I did was I uh, looked at my pants leg and there it was. It was a tick. And so I went, hmm, something said to me, hold on to that tick. You may need it. Well, two weeks later, this is where I ended up in the hospital because I was paralyzed from the abdomen down. Wow. About a week before that, what, what had happened was I was feeling tremendous pain. And I'd be calling and talking to my partners and I'd say, listen, I think I'm in a lot of stress here about this, this Comcast situation. 
They said, no, no, it's okay. It's, it's going to work out. We're going to do all right. Well, Lily just kept getting worse and worse. So consequently, I was up to the level of the pain was so bad that I could barely think. Mm. Initially, that ended me having to go to the hospital. And um, while I was in the hospital with this experience that was going on, this, this terrible spinal injury, it's very rare, hits a small percentage of people on the planet. It's a cousin of multiple sclerosis. So, wow. So when I was in the, in the hospital, I was in such agonizing pain. A point of me said, while I was going through this, I really called out to the universe and said, it just could I have just one chance to be able to help another person not go through this, get them prepared to understand what could possibly happen in something of this nature. And so that was the germ at that time that I knew I was going to be writing a book about this. Wow, that's extraordinary, Brian. When we're in pain, at least my experience has never been, what do I teach somebody else? <laughs> when I'm in severe pain, I just want relief. And it's completely self-focused. And so for you to think at that higher level at that moment in time, to me, is extraordinary. And so I'm in awe of that in particular. It's certainly understanding what you're saying, because you're in a point, it's like, it's all consuming. And I could have been in uh, that mindset of like, I, just anything, release me from this. However, it was the circumstances I was in, uh, Liliana. Perhaps if I had been home, I might not have felt the same way. Mm -hmm. But I was in a hospital and I was surrounded by all kinds of other people who were wounded and mm -hmm. in terrible pain. And when right. you're in the ER, you're in that, I call it in the book, the theater of the wounded. And so mm -hmm. it's like you're part of that orchestra of all these folks moaning and groaning and wanting to get out of their pain. So the best thing you could possibly do is reach for your better angels and just say, hey, please, wow. what can we do for us all to get out of this somehow? It also brings you real close to your humanity. Well, it brought you, um, because to me, you're such a special being. It brought you through that journey. I love what you said, that it was a theater of the wounded, that yeah. you weren't alone. And, and here's the thing. Um, many of us have been in emergency hospitals, and all we think of is, when's my turn? When's the doctor coming? We're not thinking about, we're not even hearing. <laughs> Maybe we are hearing <laughs> the theater of the wounded, but we're not thinking in the same way that you were. And so you've got a lot to teach us, and you certainly have. Um, you have written a book of that experience. So um, keep telling your story, at least what happened in the hospital, because the rest Everybody needs to read. <laughs> okay. Well, I ended up in a very interesting situation in a hospital. I guess the best way I can describe it, it was like it was a perfect storm of problems. Mm -hmm. It turned out that I landed on one of the busier weekends in the ER. So that particular ER was the big hit for all the folks to come in. Uh, there would be like all kinds of people in there who'd be drunk, they'd be wounded with gunshots, just a horrendous, uh, something out of Dante's Inferno, practically. And this unfortunately affected greatly the doctor who perceived me to not be what I was. This was an ER doctor who actually, believe it or not, when I got into this place, the pain was so bad that I could barely walk. And in the time that generally when someone goes into an ER, they go into the cubicle, they give them some kind of electrolytes, they give them something for the pain. They did not give me anything for the pain. Because they were convinced what I was dealing with was some kind of a kidney stone. Wow. And so consequently, while I was waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting, mm -hmm. the test they have to make sure is, okay, is the plumbing working okay? Well, they should have probably have guessed by the time that my plumbing was not being able to give them a measly little tiny test for a urine sample. Mm -hmm. They didn't even try to stretch. They just said... They made assumptions. Oh, they made an assumption. The big assumption was, nothing wrong with you. <laughs> Sorry. Don't wait, wait, we don't have much else to tell. 
Right. It got progressively worse after that. It got turned into like a Dante's Inferno of insanity. It was getting more and more crazier and crazier to the point, honestly, I was almost feeling like if somebody was writing a script on this, somebody would be saying, no, you, you can't do that. You can't have the guy not being seen, no pain medication. Nobody, nobody's going to believe that. That's crazy. It got so much, and I talk about this in the book, that eventually this doctor was so completely non-believing of my condition, eventually they actually tried to pick me up and stand me up after I was paralyzed. Wow. Unbelievable. Wow. They, didn't they think you were an addict or something looking for pain meds? Exactly what he thought I was, Liliana, because unfortunately at the time, my pain had turned me into some kind of a hideous visage. I hadn't eaten for three days, taking wow. just simple aspirin, things of this nature over the counter, just trying to down them to get rid of any of this pain. So naturally, my eyes were sunk in. I looked terrible. My hair was stringy. I was sweating. Yeah, I was probably a horrendous visage for these folks. Mm -hmm. And so when he saw me, he was convinced, yes, I was on some kind of a drug. Wow. And because the thing that was so insane about this, Liliana, he actually saw me in the cubicle. And what I actually had to do, and I talk about this in the book, the pain was so bad because he had neuropathy. What was actually happening around my midsection is in the spine, my nerves were getting burned away. Oh, Oh and God. so consequently, what was happening was the shirt I had, I had to take the shirt off because it was so agonized. It's neuropathy. Oh, wow. Not your feet. It's called banding. This is what will happen to you in this particular condition. And so I had to take that shirt off. And I had to actually stand holding the IV bag. He saw me doing this. So he was convinced there's nothing wrong with this guy. Not only that, he's some kind of super bean. He can hold an IV bag. Because something going to happen with the stand or something. I talk about it in the book. Everything that you can imagine that might go wrong, went wrong. <laughs> wow. But you have to keep your sense of humor about it. Because after a point, it just got so absurd. I thought, I'm in some kind of a clown circus here. Yeah. You know, Brian, um, I, <laughs> I shared this with you. I started reading the book. Um, and I must say, it is absolutely captivating. But as an empath, I felt all the stuff that I was reading. I felt your pain. I felt the injustice. I felt the neglect from the doctors because it did get progressively worse to a point where it affected your whole life, right? Um, because it probably could have been, well, I'm not saying probably, it could have been treated a lot differently and you could have had different outcomes. It's a captivating story. I, I believe that your story needs to be a movie along the lines of, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the movie, the, um, the, the diving bell and the butterfly. Oh, yes, 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 very much. Right. I so very so I, I, I think along those lines, you oh, know, yeah. where it's that impactful. And so the way you've led yourself through these incredible challenges is extraordinary. So tell us how you're looking to inspire others to step into leadership and change the health carelessness or health careless. To, and here's your book, right? Health careless. One man's triumphant journey through a fractured health care system. I had to let him know I lived. <laughs> and and, and, you're thri and, and you're thriving and teaching others to thrive. And so um, yes. and I have to I have to say, I have experienced this health careless system when my sister went into the system several years ago and you know ultimately she didn't make it so this is very much on my heart so tell us again tell us how you're looking to inspire others to step into leadership because you've done this you've led yourself well and change health careless to health care number one thing to do in this is not to hold your story to your heart it's to get out there and start to share these experiences with other people, specifically people in the medical industry. Let them know that this had happened to your friend or a loved one or something. Let them know this because they see this. They see it every day. And one of the things is if people stay quiet about this, it's just going to continue being a health care less system. That's really what it has to be. People have to speak up. And they have to be not afraid of the consequences of what will happen. Because, I mean, I saw a lot of what that can happen in, the, in that hospital. 
So speak up. Speak, tell your story. There are many who tried and continue to try to change the health careless system, right? And some of them have ended up dead. Yes. Yes. I and, myself, I was in the hospital. Right. And so thinking about that, right, to take on such a massive system, um, and not just healthcare system, and part of the healthcare system is the pharmaceutical industry and all that. We can go down a rabbit hole, but we're kind of going to steer ourselves away from that for now. Right. Um, so what are the challenges and risks of taking this on? Well, certainly some of the challenges and the risks are, depending where you live. Mm -hmm. I lived in a college town once, I don't want to say the name of the college. Uh, however, it was uh, self-contained at one hospital. And basically, if you were going to go after that hospital, there was a thing called the white line, just like there's the thin blue line for the police. There's a thing also in the medical world, a thin white line. And so consequently, if you're going to take on that system and you live in that town, you may find that hell is going to come down on your head and you may not be able to get service at that hospital because we don't accept your medical anymore. Or uh, my friend was actually, his uh, mortgage was uh, reversed because the bank was involved with one of the higher ups in this particular hospital. So corruption does happen and it does, unfortunately, it's circuitous. Mm -hmm. It goes through a lot of the system. So, yeah, he was being hassled by the cops, and he and his wife actually had to move out of the town. Mm. They nearly killed his wife by incompetence. And mm. he had all the proof, but... Yeah, really. and that certainly speaks to my heart because I had so much proof for my sister's, you know, how she experienced neglect. And she had an advocate. I can imagine when people don't have advocates. She had a strong advocate, and I had a strong case, and yet no one would take the case. No. Um, because a lot of the attorneys were in with the hospitals. And so, you know, it, it saddens me, but we need to continue and persevere and give this a voice, right? My thoughts on this, Liliana, what's going to happen now, as more and more the doctors and nurses themselves begin to age, they're going to have to enter into that system themselves. They're going to have to experience the healthcare list system, not from a being in a position of more or less how I say in the book, it's very much like an institution. When you put that uniform on, that's the uniform of the wounded. And okay. so consequently, yeah, it's like a prison outfit. And so there's been many books. I know you probably read these where a doctor went into the hospital and he said how he was treated. Well, now you've got to get thousands of people coming out and talking about these stories so they know, wait a minute, I had no idea what's like this for the patients. Well, now you do. So say something about, it. let's get something together. I mean, you know, this is how you start it. It starts with a snowball and it grows and grows and grows. But as they get older, they're going to go in there and they're not going to like what's going to happen to them. Right. And the experience through COVID has certainly also shifted that. <laughs> I see One of the things, if I may share about that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what happened after COVID? So in some ways... <laughs> The incompetence of the very tired doctors, by the way, I'll share this really quickly with you. I had no idea about this until I just recently found this out. I had no idea the level of suicide that's happening in doctors, especially doctors who are first starting out and also in schools. I had no idea of this, but this helped me to understand some of the pressure that these doctors and these nurses are under. If they look to go for psychological help of some sort, it's seen as a weakness. It is not pushed. It's just a couple of hours when they're in their studies to become a doctor or a nurse. It is looked at as, wait a minute, if you don't have the strength, the inner strength, and you can't be strong enough. Superhuman, yeah. In this field. So sorry, no, we don't accept you going to for psychological help. They even point out, would you go to a, your heart doctor if he said, Liliana, I'm sorry, I just got back from my therapist, you know, dealing with terrible depression. So when do you want to have that operation? You know, you have to ask yourself. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, maybe we'll get a second opinion. Right. It can destroy okay. their career. Yeah, certainly it's complex. Like, but I think it's really important that this is something that needs to be, because it's like in some ways we don't want to condemn these folks, but I had no idea that pressure was on their head like this. Mm -hmm. So I did want to share that, you know, on the call. Well, I appreciate that because quite honestly, the more I 
dive into leadership, the more this comes up, it's all about our capacity to love and value people and see things from people's perspective. And at the same time, challenge with love, push with love, speak with love, which to me, you're able to do because after this experience, how are you not bitter? I'm not bitter because I saw that even the doctor who did these horrendous things to me was part of a system. And I realized at one time this man had made an oath to help and save human beings. He got lost. And I realized he wasn't anything personal against me. I just happened to unfortunately fall into some kind of a type that he put me into some kind of a box. So feeling bitter, it's not going to help. Bitterness is putting an albatross around your neck and getting upset. It's like, well, you know, you got to take that albatross off your neck. Bitterness is just going to eat you up alive. So consequently, I had to realize this is a fellow who really needs to understand that he needs to get back to why he came into this profession in the first place. But the healthcare less system grinds the most noble to powder. And I saw that when I was in there. And so do I feel bitter towards these people who wanted to be noble people? Or do I get angry at the system? I guess it's easier to get angry at a system because it has no soul per se, right? It's no heart. It doesn't love. It doesn't hate. It just does what it does. It's made out of people who do love. Mm -hmm. Or have that capacity. Yes. And I was lucky enough in the book, one fellow there was absolutely working 100% from love to help me get through it. Wonderful. All right. So, you know, we have listeners that are new leaders, seasoned leaders, and as leaders, how can we take responsibility here? Okay, one thing you can do is that you can be talking and looking into finding out what is the percentage in your local hospitals that are dealing with this particular set of words. There were complications, I'm sorry to say. Look up for those numbers because those complications generally turn out to be incompetence. Mm. Keep the conversation going. If you're at a party and it seems like it's an inappropriate time to bring it up, no, it's not. It's a good time to bring it up. Bring people in so they know it's okay. We can talk about this. Yes. Be alone in there. And Liliana, even if you have a great advocate in there, your advocate only can stay with you for a certain period of time. And then they off they go, and then you're at the mercy of the system. I have a perfect story for that. My sister, you know, we were hoping to discharge her. So it was a Thursday, hoping to discharge her Friday. Um, And I was there and her issues were digestive and she was hungry and we were happy that she was hungry. So she was going to eat. And she clearly said, I cannot have dairy, red meat and red sauce. I was there. The doctor was there. The dietitian was there. So they were going to make her dinner. So I had to leave. I'm on my way home. She gets her dinner. I'm on the phone. She goes, oh, I'm so hungry. I'm excited. And so I said, oh, go ahead, go ahead and eat. And I'll call you in a little bit. Well, she calls me shortly afterwards. She's not feeling well. I find out they gave her pureed lasagna. Oh my God. My- what? And consequently, just that. Um, She was allergic to all those things that got her in a state where she couldn't be discharged, unfortunately. So yes, that hits home. And for those listening here, eventually we're going to face something like this sooner or later. And, you know, being advocates for people and telling your story is important. And as leaders, this is our responsibility to advocate for people, advocate for ourselves but also take courage because there is fear, but take courage in moving forward and telling our story. So I so appreciate you being here. And I understand that you do coaching to heal victims of health careless neglect. So tell us more about that and where we can connect with you and where we can get your book. Sure. 
Okay, so I use a specific methodology, which is called story change and coaching. I talk about it a lot in the book, which has to do with the first person's story who had to be changed was mine. Mm -hmm. I did not accept what they told me. Their story was, get prepared, you're going to probably be in a wheelchair. Now, that's one thing about the medical world. They are generally not the best at telling yes or no. It's kind of maybe, possibly, who knows, whatever. You know, it's fog in the wind. So when they couldn't give me, uh, you know, will I be able to do this? So I just said, okay, if you can't tell me if I'm going to walk again, well, then I'm going to walk again. That's all there is to it. You know, <laughs> because in the book, I tell you, I walked in this hospital. And if I can walk in the hospital, why can't I walk out? So going to what can be done to help you change your story is to just realize for the most part we at a certain point in our lives as children we may want to be a magical being be a unicorn we might want to be something like a flying star on top of a clown's head anything a child's imagination can come up with and then Unfortunately, at a certain point, an adult might come in and say, honey, that's not possible. <laughs> you got to grow up. Honey. You grow up. <laughs> and then where it gets even worse, it's like, where well, you'll hear this. So uh, you think you're going to music school, young lady or young man. You are not. You are going to follow in the footsteps of uncle blah, blah, blah. And you're going to law school. That's all there is to it. Right. So guess what? That's not your story. That's someone else. Someone kidnapped your story. So consequently, what I do with story changing is I got back my story in that hospital because they were trying to superimpose that story. You ain't going to walk again. Nope, sorry. And there were other people in that hospital. I helped them change their stories as well. So I can help you do the same because that's not your story. Someone else has taken your pen and they've written, that's who you're going to be. So that's what I can help you do. Very powerful. I know story changing, you're shifting your limiting beliefs. Um, there's so much value here, Brian. And so where can we connect with you? Sure. A couple of places you can uh, email me at Brian Van Corn, all one word, V-A-N-K-O-R-N at gmail.com. I also have my website is BrianVanCorn.com. We can get your book on your website. We can get it on Amazon. For it. Yeah, it's going to take you to Amazon. That's where the book okay. is. All so right. It's on Amazon and also Kindle. I just wanted to share one thing. I talk about this in the book because what you shared about what happened to your sister, if the folks could hear how insane this could be, because it has actually something, everything to do with what's happening right now. There's a hospital in New Jersey. It's got a nurse's strike going on. Well, I experienced being in a nurse's strike, and I can explain exactly how dangerous that can be. Briefly, uh, when the new nurses came in, the computer system got completely snafu. And a nurse who didn't know me at all was attempting to try to give me an insulin shot at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'm not diabetic. I had to fight my way to prove that I wasn't. The nurse was convinced I was actually a diabetic shock. Oh, God. oh, that's how bad things can fall apart. That's in my book. And that just talks about what can happen. I could have been a statistic. Yeah. But you're speaking to your wonderful self. <laughs> you're a statistic in a positive way. <laughs> I'm a statistic. Yeah, but I'm dancing with the universe, just like your beautiful dancer there. Such a beautiful that's one behind you. So, Brian, is there anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Yes. I'd like to share that where there's one voice, it's not going to be that loud, but where there's many, it's going to be heard. And the squeaky wheel will get the grease. So folks, start screaming. Last thing I'm going to say, I was going to share this with you. The thing about COVID has made this issue 10 times as worse because there were a lot of doctors and lawyers and techs and all kinds of folks in this industry right now who are burnt out and they're way out of their time to get out of this because it's going to be causing a lot of problems. So consequently, as soon as COVID hit, a lot of those people were going to be called up before uh, different committees to say, you know, we've got these proofs, you were this abusive to this patient, 
all that since COVID, it was like you came to the forefront. You were a good soldier. You're a hero. We're going to forget all that. You just come on back and come back to work. So now we have a lot more incompetent folks in there who just got a free pass because of that. So it's even more dangerous now. Right. And the thing is that these people mean well or meant well at one time. Right. I equated to the education system, which that's my space. And I saw a lot of incompetence in leadership and partly not their fault, but certainly our responsibility. And so, again, oh, who's to tell them they're burnt out. I mean, and then on top of that, they're fried. Where are they going to go? Right. I thought there's plenty of that in the book where people are trying to hide out. They're trying to keep quiet. Don't say anything. Hold your job. You'll be OK. It's okay to have a car mechanic doing that because you can get another car. You can't buy another body. Right. <gasps> and here's the thing. I also see how there are doctors who are awakening, so to speak, and really shifting things. Yes. And, and those are the ones we call on to continue to be advocates and to speak from their perspective. Um, yes. they're, they're starting to do that and they, they care. These are people who do care. And, you know, I think of, again, the education system, the healthcare system, both. I have stories in both, or I have a heart to really advocate for people who have been disenfranchised in both. And they're very important to me because they do affect so many people in the healthcare system. Certainly, if you're not good in leadership and leading yourself and leading others, people can die. In the school system, we are educating those people who take care of the health care system. And so both are super important. And then we can speak on government, but that's another podcast. Really quickly. <laughs> so one thing that I think it's really imperative is try to get those people who are working in those hospitals to get back on their creative tools. Because when I was in there, I actually discovered how many of the doctors and the nurses were musicians. How a lot of them gave it up. While I was in there, I talked to quite a few of them and they started to get back into their creative selves again. And they said, when they talked to me, they said, really helped me to get closer to the patients in a different way. I didn't feel so distant from them. There was a closeness to it because I love music, but I yeah. also went into medicine again, because a lot of that, you're going to go into medicine. You ain't going to music school. Mm -hmm. So that's something I just wanted to share with you. Here. And you know, what comes to mind to me about you is, do you remember that commercial? The most interesting man in the world. <laughs> Oh, that guy. Yes. That's you, my friend. That's you. Oh, gosh. Um, so, so I will encourage you to get Brian's book. And Brian, I want to thank you so much for adding value to me, to our listeners. It's been a great conversation. And my friend, it's so great to know you. Thank you. Look forward to uh, seeing you again. And uh, folks, keep listening to this incredible person. She is a game changer. She's going to make this world fly. So keep listening and share these podcasts of hers. She's a powerful, powerful voice in change for the better. With love, I might add. Thank you, my friend. In closing, here's a quick message. Coaching is the art of influence that underpins leadership in the 21st century. It is the very thing that can get you from being stuck to being extraordinary. So go to masterleadership.org and sign up to get a free coaching session. Until next time, continue to ignite that leader in you.